Welcome to Active Shooter, the podcast. After decades now of mass shootings, mass shootings, mass shootings, we haven't found the answer. A tribute to the victims of two mass shootings. A tribute to the victims of two mass shootings. Thank you for listening to Active Shooter, the podcast. You are listening to Active Shooter, a podcast that may contain adult themes, explicit language, and graphic depictions of violence. Portions of this show may be traumatic for those under 18. Listener discretion is advised. A gunman entered an Amish schoolhouse in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, shooting 10 girls execution style before turning the gun on himself. Five of the girls died. Such unimaginable brutality juxtaposed against this peaceful, bucolic community was almost impossible to grasp. But what astonished so many was the Amish response. By day's end, they were offering comfort to the family of the killer. Some of the Amish later attended his funeral. I think it's safe to say that many of us would have a difficult time mustering that kind of compassion and selflessness. But experts say it's part of the Amish tradition. By watching how this community healed itself through forgiveness, we all learned a valuable lesson from this terribly gruesome act. When most people hear the word Amish, they may think of a group of people who live their lives very simply. The Amish don't wear fancy clothes, drive cars, or even use electricity. While that is true, there is one thing that a lot of people don't know about the Amish, and that is they are some of the most forgiving people on this planet. Today's episode is about a man who some say hit rock bottom and thought that the only way to end his own pain was one last display of public violence, and how an Amish community found it in their hearts to forgive the man that took the lives of their very own daughters. If you've listened to our prior episodes, you know that the Active Shooter podcast team has taken the No Notoriety Pledge, and we will not be sharing the real name of the shooters that we cover. We will be giving the shooters a pseudonym and refer to them by that name throughout the episode. This will help in clearing up any confusion in the story while remaining true to our pledge and not naming the shooter by their actual name. In today's episode, we will be referring to the shooter as Frank. The state of Pennsylvania is home to the largest population of Amish in the United States, with many of them living in Lancaster County. Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania is described as a hamlet of Bart Township, located in Lancaster County. On October 2, 2006, The students of the West Nickel Mines School, which was an Amish school, were just coming inside from recess. By the time the students had settled down and their teacher resumed their lesson for the day, a man came into the school, unannounced. The man, Frank, asked the confused students and the teacher if they had seen a clevis pin, which was a type of fastener usually made from metal. He went on to say that he had dropped it somewhere outside, perhaps on the side of the road. No one said if they had seen the missing clevis pin, So Frank thanked them and left the schoolhouse. Within minutes, perhaps seconds, Frank had re-entered the schoolhouse, but this time he was holding a gun, specifically a Springfield XD 9mm. He told the young girls to line up in front of the chalkboard and ordered the boys to help him bring several items into the schoolhouse. A truck was backed right up to the front door. As the frightened students were doing as they were told, the 20-year-old teacher, Emma Ray Zook, ran out of a door on the side of the schoolhouse with her mom, who, along with a few other family members, were in town visiting. Obviously scared, Emma and her mom ran as fast as they could to the home of a nearby farmer named Amos Smoker. Since the Amish don't use electricity, a lot of the farmers have what they call telephone shanties on the outskirts of their property to use in case of emergency. Amos called 911 at 10.36 a.m., saying that a man had just entered the West Nickel Mines school, and he had a gun. Nine one one, what's your emergency? Meanwhile, back at the school, Frank had ordered the boys out of the school as their job now was done. Eleven of the boys that left the school had sisters that were still trapped inside. The young boys had brought in various items Frank had ordered them to bring into the school, including lumber, a shotgun, a stun gun, wires, chains, nails, as well as other various tools. They were also told to bring a small bag inside, which contained a change of clothes, toilet paper, candles, food, plastic zip ties, and sexual lubricant. 
It was evident that Frank was preparing to be inside the school for an extended period of time. Frank told the boys, a pregnant woman who was a relative of Emma's and a few other family members that were in town visiting Emma to leave. Then he told the girls to kneel down on their knees while he tied their feet together and also tied some of the girls together with zip ties. Next, Frank proceeded to nail boards to the front door, barricading them inside of the school. Six minutes after the initial 911 call, a state trooper arrived at the school, followed by more officers minutes later. The police officers attempted to try and talk to Frank, attempting to buy more time for the girls' lives, as well as try to persuade him to throw out his weapons, which he refused to do. Just prior to 11 a.m., Frank's wife returned to their home. When she walked into their home, she saw what appeared to be four different suicide notes. One was written to her, and one was written to each of their three children, and all written by her husband, Frank. Written notes to his children, one to each of the children, telling them how awesome they were, and what a good example they could be to one another. I don't know how you've put up with me all these years. I'm not worthy of you. You are the perfect wife. We had so many memories together, as well as the tragedy with Elise. It tra changed my life forever. I haven't been the same since. It affected me in a way I never felt possible. I'm filled with so much hate, hate towards myself, hate towards God, and unimaginable emptiness. It seems like every time we do something fun, I think about how Elise wasn't there to share it with us, and I go right back to anger. I am so sorry, Marie. I never wanted it to be this way. I am sorry to put you and the kids in this position, but I feel that this is best and the only way. I love all of you, and that's why I'm doing this. Your lives will be better without me. Please tell mom and dad and my brothers that I love them. Panic, she immediately tried calling Frank on his cell phone, but he didn't answer. As she was trying to wrap her head around what was going on, Frank called her back a couple of minutes later. Frank told his wife that he was angry at God and that he wouldn't be coming home, and then he hung up the phone. The police negotiator was able to connect with Frank at one point, and Frank was very upset, telling the negotiator he was angry at God and that he needed to punish some Christian girls in order to get even with him, him being God. At 11.05 a.m., just as the state troopers were preparing to enter the school by force, they heard three shots fired by shotgun, immediately followed by rapid-fire shots from a pistol. One of the shots had gone through the front window that was located next to the main entrance, and it barely missed striking a police officer. At the sound of gunshots, the police couldn't wait any longer. They started smashing out the windows, which Frank had drawn down the blinds on. They started smashing out the windows, which Frank had drawn down the blinds on with their batons in order to gain entrance into the school. What the police officers saw was unlike anything they had ever seen before. It was a complete bloodbath. There wasn't a chair or a desk that didn't have blood on it. Officers were able to open the front door, but it took them over two minutes to break through the barricade that Frank had nailed to the door. Once the door was open... They focused on trying to find any survivors that might still be alive inside the West Nickel Mine School. Two of the young girls were pronounced dead at the scene. One girl was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital, and two additional little girls would die hours after the massacre. A total of five young girls were injured, and almost all the victims were shot execution style in the back of the head. The Amish, who preferred to stay out of the media and the limelight, were not only horrified by the scene that had just unfolded, but also by the amount of media attention that the massacre brought to their community. So with the funerals planned for Thursday and Friday of this week, we would hope to have the respect of the media not to be involved in close-up gawking and picture-taking. Please respect our privacy. The media frenzy with the amount of outside people and reporters has not been appreciated. Within what seemed like minutes, there were over 100 police officers on the scene, as well as 20 ambulance, several fire trucks, five medical helicopters, and four police helicopters. Terrified parents pulled up in their horse and buggy, the typical means of transportation for most Amish, wondering where their children were, and if they were even alive. Because the Amish all dress very similar and do not carry identification, it was nearly impossible for the police to identify the victims. One thing the community could be certain of was that their children were no longer in danger because the shooter had put the gun to his own head and pulled the trigger, killing himself instantly 
in a final act of cowardice. Naomi Rose Ebersole, Marion Fisher, Anna Mae Stolfus, Lena Miller, and Mary Liz Miller were all killed as a result of Frank's actions on that fateful day. Naomi Rose was seven years old and was killed at the scene of the shooting. The pregnant woman at the school, who Frank allowed to leave the school before he opened fire, held Naomi Rose in her arms, sobbing as the young girl took her final breaths. Eight days after the massacre, the woman gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, whom she named Naomi Rose. Marion also died at the scene. At 13 years old, she was the eldest of the victims. Eyewitnesses said that Marion took charge while Frank held the victims hostage, even going as far as begging Frank to shoot her and let the others run free. 12-year-old Anna May didn't die right away at the schoolhouse. When she arrived at the hospital, however, she was pronounced DOA, or dead on arrival. Because the girls were so difficult to identify, Anna May's father was driven all the way to Christian Hospital in Delaware. When he arrived at 8.30 p.m., he was notified that his daughter had already passed away. Sisters Lena and Mary Liz were the final two victims that died from their gunshot injuries. Mary Liz was taken to Christiana Hospital. She passed away just after midnight, in her mother's arms, after she was taken off life support. After saying goodbye to Mary Liz, her parents were then driven 70 miles to Hershey Medical Center, where their other daughter, Lena, was taken after the massacre. Around 4.30 a.m., Lena too passed away in her mother's arms, after she was also taken off life support. Mary Liz was 7 years old, and Lena was 8 years old. Because they were so close in age, the sisters were nearly inseparable and did everything together. Because they were so close, the sisters were buried in separate coffins, but within the same gravesite. They were buried just as they were taken from the earth, together. Amish funerals are typically like other Christian funerals. Families usually wear black or other dark colors and mourn their losses together. Typically, Amish funerals are told in a special German dialect commonly referred to as Pennsylvania Dutch. Due to a large number of outside visitors and police officers that attended the children's funerals, each of the services was spoken in both Pennsylvania Dutch and English. There were an additional five young girls who were injured as a result of the attack. Six-year-old Rosanna King recovered from her injuries but will never be the same. She will never be able to walk, talk, or feed herself. Eight-year-old Rachel Stolfus, 11-year-old Barbie Fisher, 12-year-old Sarah Stolfus, and 13-year-old Esther King were also injured, but survived their physical injuries. We will be right back after these short messages. The Cambridge Dictionary defines the Amish as a Christian religious group that lives in a traditional way in many rural areas, especially in the eastern United States. The Amish are known for living a rather simple life. While each Amish community has its own specific rules, the most common are dressing simply, without any extravagant patterns or jewelry. The use of technology is strictly prohibited, but the amount of technology used varies from community to community. Some communities do not allow telephone use at all, while others, such as the Nickel Mines community, allow members to have a telephone shanty on the outskirts of their property for use in an emergency. Some of the New Order Amish do allow telephones inside the home. Most Amish farms use real horsepower, not machinery, to plow and harvest their fields and crops. Very few, if any, Amish communities use electricity. Most use firewood to cook their meals and heat their homes while relying on gas-lit fixtures, called mantle lights, for light. The Amish school system is also quite different than the English school system. The West Nickel Mine School was a one-room school, as most Amish schoolhouses are. It was complete with two outhouses, a small and simple playground, as well as two ball fields. Before the West Nickel Mine School was erected in 1976, all that was there was a simple pasture of grass. There is usually one teacher per schoolhouse, and possibly one or more aides. The aides are referred to as scholars, and are usually around 14 years old. This is because Amish children's education ends after the 8th grade, at just 14 years old. After completing the 8th grade, the student becomes a scholar and may continue their education in a specific field of study. It can be a teacher, farmer, shop owner, or other various paths the Amish can follow to earn a living and provide for their family. All school grades are taught in one schoolhouse by one teacher, which includes students ranging in age from 6 to 13. Frank was a 32-year-old man who seemed like any other American man. 